So my lecture today is focused on cool and lands and emerges from thoughts around how artists in the 19th century encountered Aboriginal, and in this case, Wurundjeri Woiwurrung country. These are fitting themes given the inclusion of William Barrack in the She Oak and Sunlight exhibition. And as many of you will know William Barrack and his artwork, um, this was the focus of my doctoral thesis and I draw on my thesis research for this uh, lecture. While artwork by Aboriginal artists working in the 19th century is now well known, their relationships with Australian and Australian-based painters has yet to be fully revealed. The inclusion of men like William Barrack and Tommy McRae within Australian art history reveals the changing parameters of the discipline, uh, one which is brought into sharper focus by examining an artist's connections to the Australian Impressionist movement. This lecture will chart the relationships that William Barrack had with a range of patrons and supporters, some of whom were also artists who were working in the colony of Victoria. I seek to raise the question, is this in fact a hidden history of art made visible as we reconceive the disciplinary scope and boundaries of art history? Or is this a genealogy of colonial blindness, simply reminding us of the ways in which white supremacy operated in Melbourne's nascent art world? Two questions. Um, so I argue that looking at the relationships between artists and examining their actions is just as important as expanding the parameters of Australian art history. By noting the parallels between timing and methods of Barrack's painting with that of both well-known and less well-known colonial painters, I seek to bring into focus questions of Aboriginal presence and representation in our histories of 19th century Australian art. But it is important to remember that Aboriginal art making existed long before colonization. Western aesthetics was just a recent arrival on Australian shores. So I keep this um, really in the front of my mind whenever I think about where Barrack fits um, in, in history and in art history. I'm certainly not the only one to wonder what is Australia's art history. And indeed, some of the scholars who are doing this work are, are in, this, um, in this audience. Thank you for coming. Uh, histories of Australian art have followed what Sasha Grishin has called a cultural apartheid model in which European and Aboriginal art practices are placed in separate camps. Susan Lowish has argued for a re-evaluation of Australian art history in her examination of the category um, Ab Aboriginal art and how it formed. In 19th century, uh, Victoria's developing art world, Eurocentrism really influenced what could be included in art histories. And the inclusion of William Barrack and Captain Harrison in this She Oak and Sunlight exhibition is indicative of these disciplinary shifts which we're seeing, um, which have started taking place in recent decades. It was not until exhibitions in the early 20th century dedicated to visual and material culture, still termed at the time primitive art, that Aboriginal cultural objects gained understanding among wider audiences as worthy of appreciation as art. So the National Museum of Victoria's Primitive Art Exhibition in 1943 marked the first time one of Barrack's paintings was exhibited to the public in this context that we would recognize as art history. So in this context, Barrack's relationships with Artists, both proficient and amateur, connects him in significant ways with the artistic discourses of the period, which undermines and un, sort of unsettles this parallel separateness in the histories of Australian art. While the artists in the colonial period were searching for an authentic Australian mode and arriving at a particular understanding of light through tones of blue and gold, Barak also understood, um, undertook the radical action of documenting cultural ceremonies and other representations of Wurundjeri life that he remembered prior to European invasion. I connect the representation of Aboriginal people in the paintings by colonial artists during this period with the question of recognizing Aboriginal oh, okay. art as <laughs> art. Um, some, somebody is not muted, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Studies have explored how the fervent nationalism of the years leading to federation, particularly evidenced in the Heidelberg School, 
can um, often depicted a landscape devoid of Aboriginal people, but populated with white labour and white leisure. So scholars like Tim Bonahadi and Jeanette Horn um, have made these observations, which are then um, unpacked as well in the She Oak and Sunlight exhibition. Um, some of the artists with whom Barak formed relationships chose to represent Aboriginal people in their work. Aboriginal people depicted in these paintings, however, often followed specific conventions, conforming to the wider societal views uh, that they were an alleged dying race. Um, and I hate to use those words. I'm repeating um, the terms used at the time. Sayers and others, um, sorry, Andrew Sayers and others have argued that in their attempts to establish an Australian identity, artists forged a relationship with the landscape, which visually obscured or erased prior Aboriginal custodianship and ownership. This was particularly evident in the context of the 1888 centennial celebrations, commemorating 100 years of British occupation in which the Aboriginal presence served as a vehicle for lamenting their passing. My research demonstrates that while these practices of obliteration were in full swing, Barak forged, uh, forged connections which allowed him to remain in place on the country, which was forming the subjective foundation of a nationalistic art movement. So who were Barak's peers, as I have termed them? This community was made up of Swiss wine growing family, um, one family called Dupuri, of Swiss settlers um, and artists from Scotland and Portugal and other families local to Healesville with whom Barak became acquainted. He was a frequent visitor to the Dupuri estate known as Yeringberg, and he which was established by Guillaume Dupuri in 1863. Um, it was then developed by his sons, Victor and George. Through this family, Barak met artists, um, Arthur Lorero from Portugal, and John Mather from Scotland. Barak's lifelong friend, Anne Fraser Bonn, also introduced him to South African born artist, Florence Fuller. And this circle of acquaintances was responsible for the five portraits that you see on the screen, uh, which I will detail. Alongside Lorero, Mather and Fuller, the Dupuri friend, uh, Hubert de Castella, also from Switzerland, participated in founding the um, and exhibiting at the Victorian Artists Society, an organization which connected each of these artists and one central to the exhibition of European Australian art in the colony. The society was formed in 1888 with the amalgamation of the Victorian Academy of the Arts and the Australian Art Association. Arthur Streeton, Frederick McCubbin, Charles Condor and Tom Roberts were also foundational members, but their names don't come up as frequently in this um, material that I'm describing. Using the Victorian Artists Society as a link between William Barrack and the larger Impressionist movement in Australia reveals a dimension um, to the relationships these artists had with Wurundjeri country and broader Kulin country. However, as noted, my goal is not necessarily to add Barrack to this movement as a fellow artist or portrait subject, though he was both, illustrating these connections between Impressionists in Australia and an Aboriginal artist is more about highlighting his absence and their blindness. So it's about asking, why was he not present? Um, and his art making arose from very specific circumstances, but it has its origins in cultural practices which predate the arrival of art history on Australian shores. Nevertheless, Detailing Barak's relationships is a key part of my approach to this history, and one which parallels much research into Australian Impressionists, whose friendships are so well documented. We know all about the letters and the relationships that they had. So um, I'm really interested to do something um, similar or to see what is possible in this context. Um, I begin with the Swiss families. Uh, with whom Barak became friends. So the Dupuris and the de Castellas, both were connected by marriage or close acquaintance to the colony's first Lieutenant Governor, Charles Joseph Latrobe, and several Swiss families settled in the Yarra Valley and maintained a tight network, bringing these connections with them. 
Governor Latrobe's wife, Sophie, was a member of the Neuchâtel family of Montmolin, member, uh, neighbours to the Dupuris in the region of Switzerland uh, where they lived. Once settled in Victoria, the properties of these settlers became popular places for visiting um, Melbourne elite who journeyed out to the countryside to escape the bustle of the city. The first Dupuri to arrive in the colony was Gulum Dupuri um, in 1852, but it was his sons I'll focus on um, because through George and Victor, Barak formed a long-standing connection with the family. Their father died in 1890, and after completing um, his schooling, George Dupuri took over the management of Yaringberg Winery. George continued his father's practice of employing Aboriginal um, residents from Corrindirk during the Grape Harvest, and you can see that in one of the photos. Uh, he maintained the farm diary during this period, and he makes frequent reference to the type of exchanges that he had with William Barrack. So, for example, on the 2nd of June in 1891, George purchased a deer from Barrack for 10 shillings, and later that year they went shooting together. George and Victor reciprocated these visits and were sometimes at Corrindirk to take photographs or sell potatoes. George recalled his experiences in circa 1881 that, quote, it is enjoyable to hunt with the men as they know all the countryside and especially all the types of game, end quote. In 1895, Victor became a member of the Victorian Artist Society and exhibited at their annual exhibitions. His neighbour, Hubert de Castella, was also a member on and off during the 1870s when it was known as the Australian Artists Association. Though it's not known if these two amateur artists painted together or went on sketching trips in the countryside, their joint membership of this community suggests interest and engagement in the development of art in the colony. Their connections to the society, it will be shown, further link Barrack with professional artists practice, practicing in Melbourne. Victor Dupuri, having known the Aboriginal elder all his life, was interested to paint his portrait during his training in art from Portuguese artist Arthur Lorero. Lorero arrived in Australia in 1884 and began teaching painting while also exhibiting at the Victorian Artists Society. Uh, he was well regarded during his time in Melbourne and his training in Lisbon, Rome and Paris gave him some standing. And like other immigrant artists, he was integral to the formation of the society. The Farm Diary reports that on the 11th of July in 1899, Barak walked to Yaringberg, the Dupuri property, for the first of several sittings with um, Dupuri and Lorero over the next two weeks. A sombre background was chosen in these portraits of Barak emphasising his white beard <laughs> and his piercing gaze, I think. Both Dupuri and Lorero um, both highly regarded the portraits that they produced, keeping them on display in their homes. Victor Dupuri was Lorero's pupil, and while Barak sat for the portrait um, as a subject, he also participated in an artist's lesson. Techniques and strategies of art making, the elements and principles applied to portraiture and working with oils, were no doubt discussed. Questions about mixing appropriate colours, how to capture the light falling on the elder's beard, for example, may all have been posed. Barak sat and listened, and at the conclusion of the, uh, the session, may have viewed these paintings in progress, one capturing his profile and the other his face in three-quarter profile. This provided the viewer with a unique perspective, sort of recreated here, um, of Barak while these two paintings were side by side in, um, in process. Arthur Lorero also painted a second portrait of Barak and he is unique for doing so. Um, a painting titled A Son of the Soil was completed in 1893 and exhibited with the Victorian Artists Society in April and August of that year. A small black and white reproduction from the 1893 April catalogue shows Barrack seated in profile outdoors in a background uh, with a background of tall straight trees. His pose is relaxed, I think, and he gazes into the distance. Though this reproduction is small and not in colour, the man is recognisably the Wurundjeri elder. His jacket and white beard and hair are clearly recognisable, 
though he does not look at us. The timing of this painting also indicates that these two artists knew each other for several years before Victor Dupuri and Lorero painted Barak's simultaneous portrait in 1899. This portrait of Barak varies slightly from other representations of Aboriginal people by his contemporaries, Tom Roberts, John Mather and B. E. Minns, for example, um, who often isolated their subjects from the context and in so doing conformed to a type portrait rather than painting a specific individual, although some of these identities um, are being revealed through research. Arthur Lorero also painted one, potentially two additional portraits of Barak. So in addition to the son, a son of the soil, it is thought um, this was a study for, or an earlier version of, Regulo Australiano, or the Australian tribal chief, which is um, pictured here in the National Museum of Portugal. Um, so this research demonstrates the possibility of greater engagement with Aboriginal artists by international artists living in or settling in Australia than we previously thought. Given the range of countries of origin for the artists discussed here, further investigation would produce a greater understanding of the complexity of such a nationalistic period in Australia's art history, I think. Um, another link to this artistic milieu was formed shortly after Lerero painted A Son of the Soil, when Scottish artist John Mather painted Barrack's portrait at the request of another Swiss settler. So in December 1894, Barrack sat for another portrait um, at the request of Anne Luber, though it's unclear how um, John Mather met Anne, um, Anna, the... Um, they must have uh, discussed art making and Mather and Barak um, really must have formed a relationship um, because Mather acquired two of Barak's paintings during this time, uh, which he then donated to the Industrial and Technological Museum the following year. Anna Luber worked as a governess for Swiss families in the Lilydale region before marrying Ernest Luber, who was a pastoralist who held uh, land in the Yarra Valley at various times. Barak's friendship with this family may have developed in a similar manner to others in the region as a strategy to remain connected and gain unimpeded access to his own country. Mather was born and trained in Scotland and arrived in Australia in 1878 as one of a number of immigrant artists. Unlike Lorero, who returned to Portugal later in his life, Mather made, Australia, uh, made Melbourne his home permanently. He also spent a number of years during the 1890s living and painting uh, at a property called Kumbala in Healesville. Given this proximity, it's possible um, as a plenarist that Mather visited the Luba property to paint. Mather's painting uh, is an oil study of Barak looking the viewer in the eye. Um, the tones are muted and the plain background focuses the viewer's attention on Barak's face. Barak does not smile in this portrait. In fact, his expression is very serious. And though Mather has used loose impressionistic brush, brush strokes, the elder's expression is strikingly communicated, I think. Like Lorero and Dupuri, this portrait of Barak held an important place for its recipient, Anne Luba. She presented it to Charlie Robarts, her son-in-law, who was the last superintendent at Corrindirk from 1909 until the station closed in 1925. The lasting connection between Mather and Barrack takes the form of an exchange of ideas and artwork. Um, embodied in um, these two paintings, I think, Aboriginal Ceremony and Aboriginal Ceremony with Wallaby and Emu. These are the names given to the paintings um, by the State Library of Victoria. We, of course, do not know exactly um, how Barak would have referred to them. They are painted on cardboard and cut from the same piece. They are quite large um, in, among Barak's um, collection of works. And um, he's used an oil-based ochre-rich paint quite thickly, so it stands out from the cardboard. Under the paint showing through in places, there's a pencil outline showing each figure an animal, giving us a small indication of his working methods. There are emus and wallabies surrounded by a gathering of dancers and drummers, 
posed in a schema which um, is very familiar as Barak's own um, way of composing paintings. These two paintings are now in the State Library collection, as I said, and Mather donated them to what was called the Industrial and Technological Museum in 1895. It was located in the State Library, but it wasn't until 1930 that the library began a historical collection successions book, which is the first time that the artworks gather a paper trail. Now I'll turn to um, the final artist with whom Barak formed a connection. Florence Fuller is, was a South African born artist working in Melbourne, as well as other locations, including Western Australia. She has been described as a highly gifted portrait painter, but scarcely recognized today. Born in 1867, by the age of 13, she was receiving lessons from Australian impressionist painter, Jane Sutherland, and became influenced by her uncle, Robert Dowling. She exhibited in the Australian, uh, in the Victorian Artist Society, Artist Society in their inaugural exhibition and was recognised for her portraiture. Fuller was commissioned by Barak's friend and ally Anne Fraser Bond and completed the portrait of the elder in 1885. So this might have been um, an earlier work of hers. Representing the first two, um, the first of the five portraits of Barrett to be painted. Importantly, it was a woman who commissioned the painting um, of a subject not widely pursued by artists, and it was a woman who painted it. This relationship requires further research. Um, it is also important to note that the portrait uh, was gifted by Anne Bonn to the State Library during Barrett's lifetime, so in 1901. She was also a collector of Barrack's paintings, which were donated before her death to the Ballarat Art Gallery and the Royal Historical Society of Victoria. Um, so to sum up, it was through the growing community of friends at Corrindirk that Barrack learned more about painting on paper and using watercolors and to whom he entrusted the preservation of some of his artworks. This community was made up of the Dupuris, other Swiss settlers to the region, and artists from Scotland and Portugal and South Africa. Barak was a frequent visitor to the estate at Yeringberg, uh, established by Guillaume Dupuri and developed by his sons. Through this family, Barak met artists Arthur Lorero and John Mather, and through Anne Fraser Bon, Barak met uh, Florence Fuller. These acquaintances were responsible for five portraits, um, which we have, which I've described. Um, and you can see them here. There's actually six, no, five. I get ahead of myself. There could be six, but we don't know where, um, we don't know where the sixth one is. So these artists, with whom Barak formed relationships of some kind, connect him to Australian Impressionism in interesting ways. They weren't the headline acts of this movement and some of them did not even remain in Victoria. One thing that these relationships reveal is a history beyond the canon, one in which an Aboriginal artist met with Australian and international artists, one in which we can only speculate at the types of artistic exchanges that took place but one that leads to a more expansive understanding of what Australian art history is and could be. The presence of an Aboriginal man as an artist, no less, on the canvases and in encounters with Melbourne's painters and settler patrons demands a rethinking of art historical accounts of this period, as well as contributes to calls to reevaluate the discipline itself. She Oak and Sunlight um, presents an example of the richer history that emerges when parameters of art history are expanded to include artists whose presence has been previously excluded or hidden in plain sight. In doing so, I do caution that we must not lose sight of the fact of Aboriginal creative expressions predating colonization and raise the question of the discipline's ability to reconcile its own past. Many questions arise still from this research, for example, to what extent uh, was their influence from Australian Impressionists on Barak? Did he in influence their work? And did they understand him as an artist or merely a curiosity? Outside the portraits of Barak, it was not until the 1940s that his work was included into what we recognise as an art history. 
Um, I have approached the question of Australia's art history from an interdisciplinary standpoint, um, trying to think about it from both historical, art historical and Indigenous studies frameworks. Barak's artworks understood today um, by his descendants as national treasures were variously thought of as souvenirs for tourists or material for ethnological study during his lifetime. The select few individuals who understood his artwork as art have been described in this presentation. Through his contacts with Mesa, Lorero, Japuri, Fuller and De Castella, Barak uh, was exposed to aspects of an artistic discourse of the period. And it's these very relationships which calls us to consider a new parameters of art historical um, study and the discipline. Australian Impressionism, for example, has managed to locate its women artists, as Michael pointed out at the beginning, after a long period of exclusion. The masculinist vision has been amended. Does this exhibition signify that a similar move will take place with Aboriginal artists working in proximity to Impressionists. Will it be possible to disentangle Australian art history as an approach to understanding the past from the ways in which colonisation seeks to obliterate Aboriginal cultures? Ian McLean and others um, have argued for a post-national art history to examine intersections between Indigenous, migrant, diasporic, post-colonial, global and transcultural studies within a world of nation states. Scholars around the world are currently questioning what a decolonized art history would look like. For example, is it time for reimagining the dominant narratives we've taken for granted? Why, uh, what would a canon of art look like if we changed our focus? Can we envision a Wurundjeri art history, a history of cool and art? You'll notice that I haven't overly interpreted the meaning and content of Barrack's artworks. This is something I believe that has to be done with his descendants. My argument here and my research focus is on questions of knowledge, looking from a Kulin viewpoint rather than a Western one. Barak's artwork is syncretic. It combines materials from the oppressor with knowledge and story and tradition from Wurundjeri culture. Any interpretation, I think, has to be done sensitively and in collaboration. So a parallel separateness is a poor explanation for the history I've described in this lecture. Barak was enmeshed within an artistic context, an important component of his advocacy and his diplomacy. Australian Impressionists arrived on his land and his, he used these relationships with a select few of them to ensure the preservation of his cultural knowledge. And I'll leave it there. Thank you.